Today's guest is Dr. Sydney Cohen. So I learned from this episode that I really enjoy interviewing therapists, especially ones that have been around the block like he has. It's just, he just has such a great way, you know, just such a great way of delivering a message. It's just so kind, so keenly aware, you know, there's just so much, uh, in-depth thinking about what's going on with people, which I so fully enjoy. And so I know you guys are going to love him. So uh, Dr. Sid, as we refer to him in this episode, has two books that we get into. And so the first one's called Your Self-Sabotaging Inner Bully. Mm -hmm. So I know lots of y'all need to be reading that. And so do I. We've all, we've, you know, he'll get into it, but like this, this inner bully thing, oh my gosh, it is such a big deal in terms of personal growth and health. I just see it constantly. And actually he talks about it in his other book, which we're also going to dive into, which is the inner blocks to losing weight, why you lose the battle more than the weight. So uh, really eye-opening episode. We got it, got into some, you know, inner child stuff, what happens in childhood to get us in this place, how to get out of it, getting a case of the shoulds. Um, we also talk about betrayal trauma, which is a specialty of his, which, so if you've had something like that, we get into that towards the end of the episode, which most people have, but I just, I mean, I could have listened to Dr. Sid for hours. He's just so great. He has so many good things to say. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Here is Dr. Sydney J. Cohen. Okay, Dr. Sid, this has been a long time coming. Um, I'm so excited. To, I'm like seriously over the moon. I was reading over some of the stuff in your books and I was like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> so I can't wait. To, I mean, you have so many years of experience with this. You've in the trenches with people writing books, you know, speaking to people about these things. And so let's dive into, we're, I told you, we're going to kind of dive into both of your books because I think there's some overlap here. Um, but I want to talk about um, your self-sabotaging inner bully, standing up once and for all, and also uh, your other book, um, Inner Blocks to Losing Weight, Why You Lose the Battle More Than the Weight. So as I was looking at your Inner Blocks to Losing Weight book, I noticed you kick it right off with that inner bully talk, which I was like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So can you, can we start talking about, you know, maybe for somebody who wasn't accustomed to the inner bully, a little intro background on that, and then why you decided to kick off a weight loss book with tackling your inner bully. Sure. First, I thank you for having me on. It's my pleasure to be here. So I'm going to start with the idea of the inner bully as a term that most people I work with and talk to can pretty well resonate with the term. However, just as a sort of little disclaimer, for some people, the term may be preferable to be used as inner critic, demon mm -hmm. shadow, dark side ego, you name it. I've heard a lot of different terms. Nice. I'm going with inner bully. And <laughs> cool. that's, that's where I'm going to take this. Mm -hmm. So think of the inner bully as a part of our subconscious. We all have this part of our subconscious. And the purpose of that part of our subconscious is to do whatever it takes to sabotage us. Mm -hmm. And there's two ways that it creates that sabotage, our thoughts and our actions. So self-sabotaging thinking, which basically boils down to self-critical, self-doubting, negative, obsessive thinking, but more importantly, ultimately, is self-sabotaging action. Things we do in our lives, in different contexts of our lives, weight loss being a prime example in which by doing the things we do, we sabotage ourselves. We undermine our efforts to reach our goals. In the process, we also undermine our self-respect. We undermine our commitment. And we end up kind of heading down the rabbit hole of self-sabotage. And the term I use as it's, it's kind of the idea of a, a metaphorical negative force inside of us in our subconscious and the term i use for that force is the inner bully so where does this inner bully start you know what's the root and why do some people have it stronger than others early on like, like so many of the challenges we all face personally this is something that crystallizes early on in our life and the way it crystallizes tara it comes basically in two ways both involving negative communications we can get from our parents yeah. even when our parents can actually be, well, pretty loving, pretty well-intended. However, yeah. as any parent is certainly capable of and guilty of, is certain kinds of negative communication mm -hmm. that, let me give you the two prime examples I use. I call one category direct hits. Mm -hmm. Those are negative communications we get that are hard to certainly deal with, direct put downs, belittling, and so forth. 
-hmm. That's the kind of negative communication under the heading of direct hits. However, mm -hmm. there's another category that slowly but surely early on in our life feeds our inner bully and gives it the power mm -hmm. and strength it has. I call those sneak attacks. Mm -hmm. Examples, guilt tripping. The basic yeah. message being, you are a disappointment to me. Yep. Oh God, yep. painful. Yep. Negative comparisons where we are compared, whether it's to our siblings, whether it's to friends, classmates, other relatives, where the basis of any negative comparison is, of course, how we stack up negatively to that other person, whether it's physical appearance, whether they're it's intelligence, they're academics, negative comparisons are a sneak attack. Mm. Another one is neglect, where I don't mean extreme necessarily of neglect, but where at least one parent, it doesn't take both parents, by the way, all it takes is one who's neglectful, whether it's affection, attention, guidance, mm. comfort, discipline. So that's a third sneak attack. The fourth one, and there are five all together, is abandonment, which is certainly just a very painful experience for anyone who's outright abandoned by a parent. And last but not least, is called hypocrisy. The old do as I say and not as I do. So if a parent is preaching to a child that this is something they advise the child to do, so mm -hmm. just for example, it could be to stay under control of what you eat. It could yeah. be to not use drugs. And what is the parent doing? Guess what? They are not practicing what they're preaching. They're overeating. They're into some kind of addiction, which mm -hmm. is the essence of hypocrisy. Those mm -hmm. are the five sneak attacks. Mm -hmm. So whether you're on the receiving end of direct hits, you're on the receiving end of sneak attacks, those types of negative communications are the, the driving force behind mm. the inner bully. It absorbs those messages like a sponge early mm. on in our lives, and it keeps building on those messages. The other term I kind of like to throw in the mix here is an inner echo. Well, it's mm. obviously not a literal echo, but it's as though that inner negative force called the inner bully is echoing whether it's those direct hits, whether it's those sneak attacks mm. into what becomes self-critical, self-doubting thinking, and again, self-sabotaging action. Mm. Pretty much where it comes from. I love this. And I love the names that you've come up with everything because it's so easy to, to kind of latch on to. And it's it's interesting because I, you know, it's kind of obvious you see somebody with a super critical parent and then they're super critical on themselves, right? They're just mimicking that same behavior. But I, I'm curious more on these, what did you call them? Sneak attacks? On the yep. sneak attacks. Um, is it, you know, so, cause like where my mind always goes and I'm sure you have an answer to this, but like my mind always goes little kids. I have four kids. My youngest is nine. My oldest is 16. Right. And I've noticed the stories that they create about a scenario or like, wow, like that's where you took that. Um, you know, I might be like slightly irritated that a chore wasn't done. And you know, the, my, some of my boys will yell out like, why don't you love me? And I'm like, are you trying to manipulate me or do you actually really feel that way? <laughs> you know, and, but truly though, like someone gets mad at them, everybody hates me. You know, someone's disappoints them. Nobody cares about me. They take him very far. And I'm sure that's probably developmental. And then if we don't revisit these stories, they just stay that way. Could you kind of dive into how the sneak attacks turn into the inner bully? Yeah, there's actually, it strikes me a little bit of a paradox here. So let's take guilt tripping the one yeah. I mentioned. So if, if a kid is getting a message directly or subtly that they're, they're being guilt tripped into getting the message, they're a disappointment. Well, one of the things that can happen, it may not be obvious at all, is that can get turned around. Kids through exactly your word, Tara, manipulation, know how with some sensitive parents who God knows their hearts in the right place and really mean well, they can guilt trip the parent back yeah. and they become masters. So it's kind of like a back yeah. and forth of sneak attacking. Yeah. And it isn't even so sneaky anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm always like, don't even try. Don't even try. <laughs> but you know, guilt tripping. Wow. Like I never would have considered myself a, a guilt tripping parent. Right. But as I've done a lot of my own work, I'm like, oh, I just, I just totally guilt tripped Micah. Wow. You know, these eye opening things, I'll, I'll give a quick example. I'm sure some parents can relate, or maybe if, you know, as, from when you were a kid, but I walk into my bathroom one time and my nine-year-old had peed all over my toilet seat, right? There's just pee <laughs> all over my toilet seat. And what did I do? Micah, come here, look at this, right? 
that's how I handled that. And I just, and he was like, oh, sorry. And starts to clean it up. And I'm like, oh, I, as soon as I realized that I was like, wow, I just completely shamed him, tried to make him feel bad about that. Belittled him. I was, it was like a tough moment myself. I was like, that's not cool. That's not how I'm going to handle something like that. You know, I could just as easily say, Hey, Micah, remember how we talked about this? Would you mind cleaning it up? You know, like it could have been handled that way. And I thought, gosh, we're, I, I consider myself a parent who's really diving in and doing work, you know, reading books about parenting, really trying, but I'm still doing this stuff. So I think all of us had every single thing you talked about, I bet, do you think all of us had the, not all of us, but most, the grand majority of people had a lot of those for in a lot of instances in their childhood? Absolutely. And I have a very technical term for you for how you dealt with your kid. It's called perfectly human. <laughs> perfectly human. You you know, I'm, I'm going to assume your intentions are totally in the right place. And yet kids, look, part of the issue, I think it's safe to say, is not only what gets communicated to kids from their parents. And if there's only one parent involved, okay, that's the primary communication. When there are two parents involved, that other parent is playing a very real communicational role. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what I find is that if one parent, and frankly, it's typically mom, places so much responsibility and accountability on herself for how she's communicating and the job she's doing is that she can lose sight. Hey, if there is another parent, even if not as anywhere as involved on a day-to-day -day basis, that other parent's role is very big in this. And yeah. it's so important to keep that in perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you and, for that. And just, and just, yeah. And just the one other thing I want to be sure to add is this is where I, I know you know, and what I did not get much of growing up, Tara, to be frank, is called honest heart-to-heart -heart communication. Mm. I got, you want to talk neglect? I mean, I won't belabor it, certainly. I grew up in the category of being neglected. And thankfully, I've done a ton of work on my, for myself, on myself. Yeah. I love to practice what I preach. You know, if mm. you're going to be in this field, you need to do the work yourself. Yep. And I've done this work and thank yeah. God I've done it because it's really made a difference. Mm -hmm. Because if you grow up feeling neglected, it really does take its own toll on you. So what you really have to face and really have to come to grips with is that no matter what, you want to sit your kids down. Obviously, you adapt it to the level of intelligence, level of maturity and so forth have the heart to heart talks. If they're pissed or they're hurt or they're sad or they're feeling neglected, if you can bring that out, that's wonderful. If you know that there's something on the other hand as the parent that you're feeling really frustrated about, that you don't want to think of yourself as being any kind of bully or anything of the sort, even though that's in a way what kids try to guilt trip to, almost make it sound like the parent's sort of being a bully. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no. But again, they're masters. <laughs> and what it does is it brings up your own inner bully stuff. And mm -hmm. that's where you have to tread carefully. I love this um, example of having this heart to heart because that is the energy that I, I do a lot of inner child work and with my clients mm -hmm. and mindset coaching. And I, that's the energy that I like for them to have with themselves of like, I call it like the big brother, you know, how, you know, those organizations where you could go to like the, what is it? Boys club, boy, sure. boys and girls club or whatever, you know, you imagine this like really nice mentor that's coming in and you're being all hard on yourself and they come in and they're like, Hey, it's okay. Come here, come here, come here. It's okay. It's understandable. You feel that way. Let's talk about it. Right. And so that, I love that analogy of doing that with kids because and now I guess we can kind of segue into, okay, we've recognized that we have this really strong inner bully. I guess we've got to take a little pause because we've got to see how that builds into self-sabotage more. But I love this idea, this picture that you've given of having that heart to heart communication, because I think when we do that within ourselves, when we can just say, Hey, it's okay. It's okay. You're learning and you're growing and it's okay that you feel like that. And you know, like what's going on, then we can actually open up. Right. But like, just like the parent child analogy, if we're like, you know, don't do what I told you not to do and blah, 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 blah. You know, if we're doing that to ourselves, we can't open up. We won't open up. It's just like, okay. We're just like that shut down little kid, you know? So I love that analogy. And I also, I'm kind of wondering, okay, so we've got, we've established that probably most of us have, I mean, well, you said all of us have an inner bully in, at some level, right? And, and some yes. of us is more intense than others. So let's yep. talk about, get segue back a little bit more into the weight loss game. Like how does this show up in, in everyday practical life of somebody who's trying to lose weight? 
So let's get right to the term that I use a lot in my work with my clients in the book I wrote, which is self-rebellion. Mm -hmm. And I have an, an operational definition of self-rebellion. Everybody knows the term rebellion, but there's a specific definition I work in regards to self-sabotage on the weight loss front. Defining rebellion as, and this is gonna sound pretty simple, but I think it really has a lot of meaning. Doing the opposite of what's in your best interest to do. That's how I'm defining rebellion. Doing the opposite of what's in your best interest to do. Love it, and, love it. And great. So I'm going to take that definition. I'm going to apply it in three ways to people's efforts to lose weight, much less keep it off. So we got eating more than you should, self-rebellion. Eating things you shouldn't, self-rebellion. And not exercising when you said you were going to, self-rebellion. Yeah. So each and every time on the food front, the eating front, that you eat more than you should and or things you shouldn't, it gets defined as self-rebellion because that's the opposite, of course, of what's in your best interest to do. If you say you're motivated to lose weight, you say you want to lose weight, but if you do those things fairly often, if not very often, self-rebellion. Same thing on the exercise front. If you say you're going to exercise and you don't go ahead and do that, that's the self-rebellion piece on the exercise front. Right. Moral of the story, the more self-rebellion, the less you are going to reach your goal, the less likely you are because self-rebellion equals self-sabotage. Yeah. And every time you sabotage yourself in any of those rebellious ways, not only are you obviously gonna have a lot more trouble reaching your goal, but the other thing I always emphasize, all self-rebellion is really not good for self-respect. And self-respect is a piece that in the throes of self-rebellion, we lose sight of. Nobody's really thinking about, can I really respect myself right now if I eat more than I should or things I shouldn't or don't exercise when I said I was going to, especially on the food front. Because what we all know about as much a challenge as any about weight loss is food tastes good. Yeah. There's a lot of very simple life's pleasure to yeah. eating. And if we're not doing very well emotionally, if we are kind of depressed, we are kind of anxious, we're having relationship issues, then who is not going to be more vulnerable to that self-rebellion piece? Because it's pleasure, it's indulgence at the expense of self-sabotage. Yeah, I know if any of my clients who've been on a healing their relationship with food journey with me are listening right now, they're going to be like, oh, Tara's loving this. Tara's <laughs> loving this because... Yeah. Um, what I going through my own health transformation that I recognized that the limitations I was putting on myself from that inner bully of don't eat this, you're going to be perfect. You're never going to eat anything bad again. And actually you're barely going to eat food and you're going to exercise like crazy and you're never going to change. And that's all you're going to do. <laughs> you know, this pressure, um, I learned obviously that does not work. Right. And so for me, in order to finally change my health habits and get in shape, I learned that I had to give myself permission to eat whatever I wanted. You can eat whatever you want. And I would play with it. I would exaggerate. I'm like, you want a cupcake? You can have 500 cupcakes. You can go to the store and buy the whole shop out. And you can just sit there and you can eat them all. Like I had to go to that extreme to, to like, as an antidote for this, like bully inner bully that was just like, you can't have cupcakes fatty, you know? <laughs> and so that, that process of removing the bully when there's no bully, there's no rebel. There was nothing to rebel against. It was just like, Oh, okay. I know I can have cupcakes. Okay. That's all I needed to know. My little <laughs> inner child just needed to know that I can. I'm actually just not that mature, I guess. Okay. That's all. <laughs> uh, now that I know that I can, I think I'll just have a protein shake. I'm good. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure you've seen that with people too, of like these extreme, harsh, totally unrealistic expectations that they put on themselves. I'm like, that is how I know you will be binging. If you keep telling yourself, no candy, no candy, no candy, candy, I promise you, you're going to be eating candy. I've seen it every single time. You will, you will. But if instead you can take the pressure off and just say, I can have all the candy I want. Okay. What is it that I really want? Uh, I really want to feel good. Okay. What's something else that tastes good. That kind of gives me that fix. Ooh, those frozen grapes are really good. I like those, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I love this talk so much. Let, let me go one step further from, Please. From, from what you're saying. So I almost forgot I want to bring this in the mix. When we're telling ourselves, as kind of like you're describing and implying, we tell ourselves, I want to get should in the mix, the shoulds. Yeah, yeah. Shoulds are big trouble. <laughs> so here we are saying to ourselves in so many words what we should or shouldn't eat. 
Okay, should or shouldn't exercise, staying with food, just eating and food for the moment. When we get a should thought or shouldn't thought in our mind, I call that cognitive split number one. Okay, what well, we're not the least bit conscious of because that thought, the should type thought comes automatically. We don't yeah. plan it, it just comes spontaneously and yeah. automatically. Well, when that thought comes, I give a label to that. I call it the lecturing parent. It's as though at that moment, you are kind of wagging your finger at yes. yourself. You really <laughs> should eat this. You really shouldn't eat that, et cetera. Okay, yeah. God knows how many people do that. So that's split number one. Actually, the bigger problem is cognitive split number two, which is talk about automatic. I call cognitive split number two, the rebellious kid. And still no consciousness or intentionality here, but it's as though right. almost immediately, the rebellious kid kicks in and says, don't tell me what I should do or I shouldn't mm -hmm. eat or should, because mm -hmm. now I'm going to go ahead and just go yep. right and overindulge. Right. The moral of the story there being, we really need to not talk to ourselves like a lecturing parent. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, how emotionally mature you may be and whatever. That kind of self-talk inside is going to trigger us. We don't intend it to trigger us, but it can trigger this yeah. calling it rebellious kid. We want to talk to ourselves in a way that really is just kind of a, a mature adult yeah. talking to ourselves. You know what's in your best interest here. You know you can indulge occasionally. Right. You have permission to indulge occasionally. But right. if you say you really mean business about sticking with your goal and reaching your goal, then you need to do the right thing and not rebel. Mm -hmm. Well, my biggest thing with shoulds is they remove all joy. So something that could have been enjoyable, mm -hmm. a workout that you could have really enjoyed or a healthy meal that you could have really enjoyed when you're just doing it. Cause you should, it mm -hmm. takes all the joy out of it. And then when there's no joy, you don't want to keep doing that thing anymore because it's not enjoyable. So, uh, you know, even for me, an accountability is a word. How much Ooh. do we hear that in the health industry? Right. I just need someone to help hold me accountable. And I'm like, that's not me. That's not right. me. Because the energy of accountability is the same th exact energy of this parent with the finger, you should be doing this. And it's, you know, I used to have accountability calls in my coaching. We'd all get on a Zoom call together and it's, what do you want to be held accountable for this week? And finally, I had a breakthrough. I was like, I don't like this energy. I don't like this. It's this passive, you're supposed to do that. And if you didn't, you fail. Like, I don't like it. So all we did was change the word to what do you want to do this week? What do you want to do this week? Yeah. Uh, quote unquote, accountability compliance skyrocketed because now it's just a want to. And I love your talk about shoulds. Cause if it's like, what do you want to eat for lunch? That's that mature energy. Like, what do I really want? Okay. I want something that tastes freaking good. It better taste good. It better taste good. Is, mm -hmm. How amazing are the human bodies that our fuel source tastes good? Like that's brilliant. Whoever designed these awesome things, whoever, you know, <laughs> different people think designed them, but you know, it's what, what do you want? That is that mature energy. What do you want to eat? Do you want to go work out? Do you want this for yourself? Yes, I do. You know how I tell my clients too, like, if you don't want to do the workout that I gave you that day, and it's going to keep you coming back for more, if you can go do something else you want to do, go for it. Cause all I care is that you keep going in there. But if every time you go in, it's this, you should be doing legs today. And you're just like, I don't want to do legs today. I don't feel like doing like, you know, it's that same, the shoulds just remove all the joy and they really sabotage in the end. So thank you for bringing that up. It, it sounds kind of like really what you're describing that I think sounds terrific is kind of a mindfulness practice. Yeah. That you're being mindful of what is the best way to communicate with yourself, to cut down on rebellion and to increase your own commitment to yourself that you really are going to do what's in your best interest. Really what you say is what you want to do and you're mm -hmm. showing it in your actions. Because I don't know about you, but to me, the wisest thing anybody ever said, whoever said it first is actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say you really want to stay the course, you really want to eat what's as healthy as you can, really want to exercise, you really got to prove that in your actions. And if you do, you much better chance you're going to stay on course. And again, I go back one of the terms I my patients, my clients will hear me over and over. Self-respect, self-respect, self-respect. I'm a yeah. huge self-respect cheerleader. And yeah, I let's dive into it. Let's, let's dive into that since that's one of your big things because I love the talk of self-respect. How does, how, in your opinion, in all your years of experience, how does someone 
get more self-respect or what are the blocks to self-respect, just not following through, not keeping them word, not being able to sh- have any track record with themselves or, and, you know, can you dive into that a little more? Sure. There's, there's a little exercise actually that I not mm. only preach to my clients, but I make sure that I do myself. It's kind mm. of a simple idea, but it, it really has some pretty useful benefit. It's called self-credit time. Okay, it's something Mm. to do at the end of the day, just before bedtime, Mm. only takes a minute or two, not a lot of time and energy. And what it is, there are six categories in this exercise, effort, self-control, goals met, acts of kindness, acts of courage, and anything creative or fun. But I want to especially zero in on self-control, goals met, and well, let's especially go with those two, to some degree, courage. When at the end of the day, literally, not the old cliche at the end of the day, I mean, literally at the end of the day, (laughs) if you look back on your day and you know there were times that day that you really made the effort to do what you say you were going to do, if that day you exercised good self-control, you ate only what you should and no more than should, whatever your program or plan of eating, you stayed the course and didn't rebel. And therefore, in the process, you met a goal. The goal for that day was to do the best you can. And if you did, that's three categories you met at the end of the day. You met effort, you met self-control, you met goals met. Point is, over time, as the days go by, the weeks go by, and then there's other things on this in this exercise that aren't necessarily directly related to weight loss. Again, acts of kindness, acts of courage, those are some of the other categories. I believe If you're doing these six things, if anybody, you're doing them, I'm doing them, anybody's doing them, not every day, but over the course of our lives, we are guaranteed self-respect. Doesn't matter what we do for a living. Doesn't matter what our income is. Doesn't matter what house we live in. These six categories are for everyone at every level of every type of background. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a mindfulness practice. That's beautiful. It's just being real with yourself. Sometimes I was just texting my two girlfriends this morning about a realization I had. I'm like, it's a tough, but very important pill to swallow. And I like swallowing tough. It's tough pill to swallow about myself, but I got to accept that. That is where I'm at in that arena of my life right now. Like, and I got some work to do. And actually, once you can accept it, it actually becomes fun. Cause it's like, okay, now I at least know what I'm dealing with here. Like, ah, I got it, you know? And so that practice of just being real with yourself, accept, accepting, like, this is how I'm showing up in that arena of my life. Okay. Got it. You know? And then I think, you know, that practice, I like that practice because it's, um, what I like to tap my clients into is how do I feel as a result of the choices that I'm making? Okay. And mm-hmm. how do I feel when I make that choice? So when I meditate, how do I feel when I don't meditate? How do I feel right? When I work out, how do I feel when I eat this way? How do I feel? And getting in touch with that, but having some sort of practice like that, where you're actually identifying it. Cause sometimes we just, you know, it's life where it's going, I'm going to my son's football game and blah, blah, blah. I'm not like, how did I feel as a result of my lunch today all the time? You know, so <laughs> having a practice like that is really helpful. The feedback I've gotten Tara over the years in, in, rep- in recommending this exercise is that it's got categories. It isn't just say open-ended, broad right, right, or some guidance. Feel good at the end of the day, right. So that it definitely helps to have the categories. Yeah. The other thing though is I want to throw another word into this mix. I'm huge with trying to make sure we get all the words yeah. in here that we can get, and that's the word deserve. Mm. So I can say to a client. You may, in your own experience with your client, say to a client, you know, you really deserve to feel good. You really deserve to feel happy. Some people absorb that, believe it, embrace it. And it's not necessarily a no brainer totally, but they kind of know, yes, yeah. you're absolutely right. But there are enough people. You can say those words. You know, you're coming from authenticity and transparency, but there's something blocking that mm. person from truly embracing it, yeah. from truly believing what you yeah. believe that they really do deserve it. Part of why then I pitch this exercise, this self-credit exercise is because if people who do this exercise see they are meeting these important categories that they can say, oh, it's just the little stuff. No, 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 no. It's big stuff. It's big stuff because it helps you reach big goals. What I also see that it does is for people who question whether they really deserve to feel good, where they really deserve to get credit. Mm -hmm. This exercise helps them believe what you're telling them. You know that they need, you know that they deserve it. 
this helps convince them themselves in their own eyes. And that mm. really adds impact. I love that. I, you know, I'm sure you've come across like, at least in my experience being a mom, it seems to me that kids have a negative bias in life. I think it's a survival instinct. You know, it's like, if you see a mountain lion or a rainbow, you know, it's probably more advantageous to notice the the mountain lion than, Oh, pretty rainbow. <laughs> but like, I, it seems like unless you work this muscle, like you just described of noticing how well you're doing, noticing these positive, it's, it's, it takes conscious effort to, to, to be aware of how well you're doing. So that's such a, such a wonderful practice. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm going to totally switch gears, <laughs> totally switch gears. We are totally, oh, this is podcast two guys, because I know this is one of your areas of expertise and I really want to get into it if we can. Um, and that's betrayal trauma. Can we totally shift gears. Can you talk about what betrayal trauma is? Cause I just think this would be something really helpful for anybody who gets a chance to listen to this episode. So when I put the, um, self-sabotage and a bully book together, I wanted to do a chapter on betrayal, putting that chapter together. I did some research and I came across a book called betrayal trauma. And I already been in practice for quite a while. I had never heard either of the book it's written by a psychologist out in Oregon. I hadn't heard of the book. And I had actually, no matter how many years I was already doing this work, I had never heard anyone put the two words together in the mm -hmm. same sentence. Mm -hmm. Obviously, betrayal comes up. Obviously, trauma comes up. But it was the first time I had yeah. ever heard anyone put them together. And truthfully, Tara, it had a really big impact on my mm -hmm. thinking professionally and personally cool. as well. Cool. So let me, let me take the two terms. So, I mean, everyone knows the terms, but again, kind of using some operational definitions. So I'm going to start with betrayal. The definition I use in my work of betrayal is any painful feeling of letdown by someone important to you based on what you believed you had the right to believe they would never do to you. I use that definition because I'm sure you can hear from that definition. It's got a pretty wide range of context and applicability. Okay. It's easy enough to automatically think of betrayal as much as any, especially in adult life and relationship life as cheating and infidelity. Sure, that's a big betrayal, but it's not the only type. Given that definition, what you define as a painful feeling of letdown by someone important to you is what betrayal is to you. Now let me get to trauma. Everyone basically knows what the word trauma. Not every betrayal is traumatizing. So won't go that far in making a generalization. Here's why I will make a generalization. It's hard enough. It's painful enough to be betrayed and discover the betrayal. But the vulnerability to crossing the line into being traumatizing is if you're totally blindsided. Yeah. If you didn't yeah. have a clue, you didn't see it coming at all. Obviously, that means blindsiding. That's the type of, of, of betrayal that really is basically the worst case scenario. And you do become more vulnerable to it becoming traumatizing. And if it becomes traumatizing, you got a real challenge on your hands for healing and it takes some real hard work. Mm, yeah, because it's such a shock, right? So you go into that. Total shock to the system, correct. Right, right. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm like, who is listening that hasn't had something like this? So, you know, what, what are your recommendations for somebody in coming out and healing through that? Besides obviously working with a therapist would be most ideal. I would say, you know, which you obviously do, but you know, what are, do you have some tips for somebody who has gone through this experience? Yeah. One of the most important things that I've seen come up pretty often is if a person really has been traumatized, they are in shock, there is a numbness, there's a dissociation, depression and anxiety can set in. I mean, we're pretty much talking PTSD right. for all intent and purpose. Right. Betrayal can trigger its own form of PTSD. If mm -hmm. you are the victim of a betrayal and you have those kind of symptoms and therefore you're traumatized, one of the things you wanna be real clear about, it's not drama, it's real trauma. Because mm -hmm. what I've seen all too often is for some people, not necessarily all the time, but for some people who know that they've been traumatized, the message they can get from some people around them is, oh, come on, it's not really that bad. Oh, it's time to move on. Oh, it's time to heal. As though the person's caught up in drama rather than trauma. Mm. Yes, there are times a betrayal isn't devastating. It isn't traumatizing. 
but for the times it is. Part of the healing is to make absolutely sure you don't let anyone judge you. Yeah. You don't let anybody influence you to in any way downplay the reality yeah. of what you're going through, the pain yeah. you're in. And that's actually as important part of the healing, in my opinion, Tara, as going for any therapy or counseling. You need to comfort yourself. You need mm. to have compassion mm. for yourself because you mm. really are hurting. No mm. way is this drama. It's trauma, self-compassion, self-comfort as important as therapy. Yeah, I've I, I personally been through what I would definitely consider betrayal trauma twice in my life. And the immediate, I remember the most overwhelming feeling that I had was I felt stupid. I felt mm -hmm. stupid because I didn't see it coming. I felt mm -hmm. stupid for I felt like this like dumb, <laughs> oblivious woman that just had no idea what was actually happening around me. And that was that self-judgment. I mean, that's that'll it'll break you. I mean, I was definitely in trauma, like definitely. <laughs> and you know, it all thankfully for me, I was introduced to some really wonderful healers, coaches, you know, and, and the people who know what they're doing. And I was able to get support out of that. But I, you're absolutely right. Like if you want to make that a thousand times worse, be hard on yourself for being betrayed. <laughs> and, you know? and, and guess where I'm going with this inner bully. Yep. <laughs> the, the inner bully loves when we're vulnerable to feeling a lot of pain and then to really kick our own butts about it. Yeah. That's where the inner bully thrives. Yep. And unfortunately, it can be, as you experience, God knows I have, that's where the inner bully is really powerfully sabotaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a shark and with blood in the water. It's like, ooh, they're already being hard on themselves. <laughs> How much worse can I make this? <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing the Jaws music in the background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is we have to consciously choose, you know, we have to consciously choose to take the blood out of the water, to not give the inner bully so much to feed on by consciously choosing self-compassion, consciously choosing kindness and gentleness or that big brother energy of like, Hey, it's okay. It's okay. You're going to be okay. And it's understandable that you're in this and let's take a look, you know, with that more neutral energy. That's what I, I'm always trying to work with myself. You know, it's, I think it's normal when maybe sometimes I have like healthy shame where I said something very insensitive. I didn't realize how insensitive it was. Somebody called me on it. And it's that moment of, Oh, you're right. That was Mm, not my best moment, you know? And, but after that initial feeling of like accepting that being mm -hmm. gentle with myself, that gentle, neutral, like, Hey, it's okay. You know, we're all growing, we're all learning, you know, has been really helpful for me on my growth path, because without that, I actually think I used to be more, I know I definitely used to be more defensive, right. I wanted to prove that I was right, you know, and all of these things. And I actually it blocked me from growth. So yeah, taking the blood out of the water, no feeding for for the inner bully is like a conscious choice within ourselves to move into compassion, I think, and, and kindness and neutrality and taking a look in that energy. Which is, I mean, what you're describing is beautiful. It's what we all need. We need it as being perfectly human people. Yeah. And we need it the most when we're in pain. That inner yeah. child, as you're calling it, needs it. It doesn't yeah. matter how old we are chronologically, obviously. Yep. We need, here's how I'm going to sum it up. I've said this to enough people over the years. If we treated ourselves the way we treat our clients, the way we treat our friends, the way yeah. we treat our family, I'm, I'm virtually out of business and I'm only half kidding. <laughs> yeah. But the truth is we are obviously the toughest of all on ourselves. And when we have what you're calling more the neutral energy and we're being that comforting and passion, compassionate with ourselves what a gift. What a yep. gift. From yep. to us. Yeah. You, you mentioned the inner child and if any, you know, parents or you, even if you're not a parent, you can imagine this. If a kid is crying, maybe they're sounding the alarms. Maybe they're over exaggerating, whatever it is. It doesn't matter if you're sitting there, they're crying their heads off and you're like, well, you shouldn't have taken that from your brothers. Blah, blah, blah. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to cry even louder. It's just going to, everything's going to escalate. But if like, if we can meet that with calm, of just like regulating our own nervous system and just looking at them like, okay, 
okay, just validating them for a second, just hearing, they just want to be, they just want to be heard. They just want to be like, you know, that's their emotion in the moment. And so I think if we can take more of that on ourselves, especially like, okay, let's say you binge eight, you binge eight because you've been inner bullying, inner critic, you know, whatever you want to call it and rebelling like crazy. If you can have compassion on that, if you can be kind with it, it's like, Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? Okay. You know, that, that to me is the, t- the ticket out. I have to tell you, talk about in a way being sync in sync. You just did like a breath. And what I was about to say is one of the best things we can do mm. for us, centering and grounding through our yes. breath. Yes. I don't know about you, Tara. I, I have made breath work as important part of my daily existence. Every day. <laughs> yep. And especially then when we're caught up in anything that's agitating, like getting caught up in rebelling or self-criticism, whatever it is, to go to the breath. I mean, different people may use somewhat different techniques or strategies, yeah. but that's one, that centering and grounding of ourselves, that's by itself a gift. Yeah, totally. I do it even on podcasts sometimes when, because I, I'm very extroverted and I get very excited to talk to people and, blah, 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 and I can feel myself mm-hmm. like on level 10 billion. And I'm like, Oh, Tara, you're like, so I'll just be listening. And I'm just really expanding that my entire rib cage. And it's just, it's such a hack. It's such a hack. It's so, uh, you know, I used to like my, my dad, my, my dad was so good about this stuff. You know, he'd teach me and I may be like, uh-huh. Yes. Take three deep breaths, you know, like <laughs> little punk teenagers, <laughs> but now I'm like, Oh, you were right, dad. You were right. That helps a lot. So yeah, thanks for sharing, highlighting that. And, you know, I, and I say this to enough people and I've really taught myself this, it's kind of become a cliche, you know, take a deep breath. What actually is a wonderful thing, as you experience yourself and as I do, is if we take, and I do mean what you just said, three, take at least if there's a moment to take three breaths in a row. Don't just do one. Take a few. Because each one of those, talk about regulating the nervous system as you brought up, there's through our breath, we are directly stimulating the part of our nervous system for people may know the term parasympathetic nervous system, which is the slow down calm part of our nervous system. We are bringing it into action and action that can slow us down and do that grounding and centering breath work. Obviously Mm -hmm. we both are Above due it. to the due to the nature of the topic of our episode, like I have to share this. I, I I know some of my avid you know followers or podcast listeners may have heard this story, so forgive me, but I have to highlight this just in case someone hasn't. I went through a period. It was after my one of my big betrayal traumas. I had lost mm-hmm. everything. I was barely you know it was a very scary time in my life, and I was just starting entrepreneurship. I was just starting my journey, and I was you know trying to grind and stay up till twelve you know o'clock in the morning and get up at four and like. You know, it was the the work. I'll sleep when I'm dead mentality. I was in total scarcity, survival mode, you know, just all of that. And even though I had already gotten healthy and I had been eating healthy with, you know, no limitations, felt like I was in a great place with food, I started getting donuts late at night. I started driving to get donuts late at night. And I was like, what is this thing? What am I doing? And so finally, one day I started a hack that I do is I talk out loud to myself, like in my car. It really helps (laughs) because when I have to answer myself out loud, I get clarity. Right. So I'm Mm -hmm. like, okay, what's going on? (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm driving to the gas station to get donuts because I'm stressed out and tired. And if I do this, I won't have to finish that project. Boom. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, so what do you think you should do about that? And I was like, go home and go to sleep. But by my little inner rebel was like, no, like, no, I'm going to get donuts. I want a donut. Right. Like I had pa- built in this like Pavlov effect with it. It had been like the third or fourth time I had done it. So that's when I was like, what's going on here. Right. And so I talked to myself, I had a little negotiation and I was like, okay, you can get donuts, but first just go home. And I just want you to breathe for 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, mm-hmm. no, 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 I'm just going to go. This is stupid. No, because I'm going be, I'm to be up even later and like, no, no, no I'm just going to get it. Right. But I, I was luckily had the, had the inner strength to do it. I was like, you can just, just try this tonight. Just try this tonight. And if you hate it, you can just keep getting your donuts or whatever. Right. So I drove home. I started, I laid down on my bed and started breathing. And the next thing I knew it was the next morning. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so in one night I solved that problem. I was like, okay, Tara, you can't stay up this late. This is like, you're just no, and you're tired. And if you get that breathing, getting myself into the parasympathetic, I was able to give my body what it really needed, which was not sugar and processed garbage from a freaking gas station. It was it was breath and sleep and rest and recovery and parasympathetic. So I had to share that story because when you're talking the importance of breath work, and especially when we're talking about not self-sabotaging or binging or overeating and all these things, don't underestimate the power of breathing to get you out of that. Even when I did a bikini competition and it was horrible, it was an experiment as a coach and I hated it. <laughs> it was, I was so hungry. I had a moment like that again too. And breath breathing was got what got me over the edge. So I can't emphasize enough how important that is. And anybody who's having these triggering moments with like wanting to overeat and binge and things like that, try de deep breathing. Yeah. And, and you experienced what a God center was for you. I know what it is for me. And a lot of people we preach it to yeah. we really stick with it. Do the bottom line is also you can do it as many times each day as you yeah. want or need. There's no rules, there's no laws that say, if on a particularly tough day where you're extra challenged by self-control, you're extra challenged by something extra stressful. Yeah. So on that day, do it more. Yeah. You can, and, and one of the things yeah. that we both know about breath work, probably a lot of people do, what's really terrific too, you can do it anywhere, yeah. any place, any time. You yeah. could be sitting there in the middle of a conversation, be in a meeting, be in a Zoom meeting. And meanwhile, if you're doing your breath, nobody's noticing right but you are benefiting unless you're doing like the one minute breath or the fire breath <laughs> well, this is true. This is, this, this we want no to be a little less obtrusive yeah in case you guys are wondering it's like a really fast rhythmic in and out <laughs> this is true but if you're hey if you're you know wanting to bring some fun to the meeting go for it okay oh man dr said thank you so much for coming on today i'm like just talking to you i'm like i love interviewing therapists especially you're so seasoned you've been doing this so long it's just so so much wisdom i just i know we could go for 10 hours and you'd still be like and here's another life-changing <laughs> tip um but guys if you want to find more from um dr sydney j cohen.com no sorry it's just sydney j cohen phd we'll link it up in this in the show notes at c-o-h-e-n um and it's s-i-d anyway in case anybody's listening sydney j cohen phd.com he's got all this services youtube videos how to contact him his specialization psychotherapy webinars you know all of that and then also links to his books which again we'll link up in the show notes but that that's your self sabotaging inner bully and inner blocks to losing weight um those are both available on Amazon and thank you for creating all this thank you for you know the passion i know it takes so much passion and desire to bring actual useful tools to people that can help change their lives you know it's an extra degree of work on top of the work that you already do so thank you for creating this. Thank you for coming on and sharing with us today. And I'm looking forward to talking to you more, collaborating more, sending people to you. I was telling them, I'm like, yay, I need you. I need people. I need someone to send people to when they got to go deep on some of this stuff. So just appreciate you so much. And thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much, Tara, for having me. This is really great.